of a pond impact. I came up over my dad's back seat. I snapped my left femur, and which is a thigh bone, and I hit the windshield, and I had an open skull fracture. And I was literally clotheslined at the neck, running full speed, at least 15 miles an hour. Um, whole body kept moving forward. It grabbed me at the jaw, so it yanked. Uh, I was a near internal decapitation. You look great. You, you must be great now. Um, Ashley, what, what other things can you think of that people have said? Cause I just lost my train of thought. Why we sleep too much or, you know, I get headaches too. those types of things like trying to, you know, relate or not understanding why we need so much rest. What are some things that you feel like you could politely say to someone who comes at you with such negativity. You know what I mean? Hmm. So we'll start with you, Jason. Do you have any, you know, any ideas? First, I just want to take a second to, uh, I'm, I'm really big on this, to acknowledge the compassion that you had for your TBI symptom of just losing your thoughts, right? I saw it clear as day as a TBI survivor, I've been there a million times where I'm trying, I got this really clear thought and then boop, it just is gone. And I used to be very, I used to get really angry about that. The, the, my blood would boil. I wouldn't have compassion. So just want to acknowledge that and share that because that's an Thank important you. recognition, right? Yeah. To be um, aware in that moment, to have that compassion and say, you know what, I'm going to pass it to Ashley for a second. So well done, my friend. Thank you. Um, Second, um, in regards to your question is, I mean, one of the things I always got as a valet manager was, oh, you're so articulate. You know, I, I, I'm a spoken word artist, right? Like, um, I'm in great shape. Well, I was running seven to 10 miles a day. <laughs> like, you know, it didn't mean that um, I wasn't impaired. It didn't mean that it didn't take so much out of me to be able to go from point A to point B to gather, to find the words to share with you. It took so much more for me to find it than it used to. Cause you know, it's point A to point B to point C to, you know, it's not going from point A to point B anymore. It's going from point Z, point A to point Z to X to M to N, and then it reroutes to B. And so the, 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 the pathway that the information has to travel for us to process it is greater. One of the things that I used to tell people um, when they were in denial, I think that's an important part. And I heard you say those who want to listen and those who want to be educated. Um, I would say that I would, in my experience, a lot of caregivers have been in denial. They aren't willing to accept that we are a different person. They aren't willing to grieve the loss of the old person that we once were. And so um, what I would tell people is I would say, you know, if I was in a wheelchair, you wouldn't expect me to get up and run, would you? You wouldn't expect me to get up and walk, would you? And they say no. And I go, okay, well, I ask that although I present myself very well, um, I ask that you listen to me when I say that my brain is in a wheelchair and I'm having trouble. And that helped sometimes for them to connect that. In others, I found that there were experiences, um, and this is a recent lesson for me, is there were actually experiences where people kind of were able to relate and I wasn't able to accept that um, because it's so, so intense for us, right? Correct. It's so intense for us. Uh, a quick story is my best friend, um, he, I asked him the other day, I said, you know, how bad was I in the beginning? He goes, you're not ready to hear that. And I said, I am, I am. And he goes, you didn't make sense, man. You didn't make sense at all. Um, and it's like, anytime I tried to bring you back, every time I tried, you know, that was that denial part, right? He wanted to bring back his friend. 
Um, I would get angry. Why would I get angry? Because I felt dismissed. I felt rejected. I felt ignored. And that's what we feel when people show up in this way, when they tell us, oh, well, I know what that's like. And da, 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 da. great. I understand you might know what that's like. But what we're trying to express to you is that's not helpful for us in this moment. It's not relatable. We don't feel like you can actually relate. So maybe just sitting with us, you know, maybe just ask, you know, asking more questions, active listening, right? Uh, doing what I learned in cognitive therapy is called teach back, you know, um, sharing what they interpreted as the caregiver. What is it that I just shared with them and saying, this is what I understand that you just said. And that gives me the ability to say, no, that's not what I meant at all. And we can we can reframe it and try. And then sometimes we just might not be able to be on the same page and we might not want to run, you know, keep button heads on that. But, you know, teach back works really well for survivors. Teach back works really well for caregivers where we we express our interpretation of what we're discussing instead of I can't tell you how many times I've had TBI survivors or I've done it myself. Somebody's explaining some instructions to me or they're telling me a story. And I just look at them and I go, uh-huh. <laughs> yep. Totally understand you. I have no idea. I can't follow the path, right? <laughs> right. But a more honest approach would be like, I, I really don't understand what you're telling me. Can you try to explain that in a simpler way? Yeah. You know, um, they might get frustrated, et cetera. But at least what it does is it improves the communication. If we can break down some of these barriers where we're making assumptions right? Um, because the caregiver, the, the, the friend, the family, the, fr the, the stranger, like you said, it's invisible. They can't see it. And toxic positivity is a real thing. You know, when you come up and you try to find the silver linings and you try to uplift me, it's not that time. What it's right. time for is to sit with me, to listen to me, to help me speak what I'm going through. So that I feel like I'm not alone. And those are some of the best ways I have learned to be able to navigate those situations. And in other ways, I've had to learn to just let go. Yeah. I've really had to learn to let go, to not feel the need to be understood. Because I feel so alone and I feel so unseen that I was almost like in the very beginning, I was like, see me. You've got to see me. How do you not? I'm. I'm like, you know, like, because inside the chaos is so much, right? It like is. We, we imagine, we can't imagine that nobody can see this. Right. Right. And That's so we're correct. like, how do you not see me? <laughs> right. It's, it's maddening. So, you know, if the caregivers and all those people can just try to slow it down, understand it takes time and we are moving slowly. You know, there's cognitive decline here. You know, um, to wrap this up, the, the story I was going to share was my friend, um, what he was doing was he started to recognize that I was just getting angry. So he pivoted and he started to try other ways to figure out how I would respond to him. And eventually what he learned was he had to flow. He had to flow with me, not try to control the situation. And what he was doing was he was listening more. And, you know, he, as he, as he's older than me by over a decade, um, he was, he would share with me about how he would forget things and, and forget his keys. Oh, guys, we all know how hurtful that is for us, right? Like all day, every day, do we forget everything? And it's not like forgetting our keys once or twice a month. It's all day, every day. And right. so, you know, he was sharing that as he's going through cognitive decline, as he's getting older. And the older people had keep telling me, hey, I get this. I understand this cognitive decline. And there's this connection that's coming to me. The more I'm having these conversations that us with brain injury, we experience cognitive decline. And people who are older are experiencing cognitive decline. And cognitive decline is cognitive decline, right? So there right. will be some similarities to that. And what cued my friend into that to shift into starting to understand those parts of me 
to be more compassionate was he watched a, um, a movie on CTE and concussions where they took a football player from the 70s who was 60 years old who passed away. And um, he they they found he had CTE, but his brain was like he was 85, although he was 60. And so there was cognitive decline. There was literal aging that had happened. And so I, I'm starting to believe, I'm starting to find the synchronicities and the patterns in this, that, they're, that the older generations may actually be kind of experiencing to some similarities what we're experiencing in cognitive decline. And I hope that as I explore this, that maybe we can shed some more light onto that too. Yeah. I think you nailed the the key there, listening. Because yeah. most people, they hear you, but they're not listening to you. Right. And that's important. Um, Craig, what, what would your thoughts be on that subject? Um, thanks for sharing what you did, Jason. Uh, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot involved with this that because it is an invisible disability that people can't get it. And, um, you know, I, I share this, um, just from my perspective, I, uh, my brain injury happened 56 years ago. So, you know, I grew up with an invisible disability in 1967. There wasn't any, anything in the way of brain injury understanding or insight or, Otherwise, so I spent a lot of my time uh, being blamed, shamed, and scapegoated for things I didn't really know how to compensate. I grew up in a situation where I was the scapegoat, you know, in the family system uh, theory. Uh, Virginia Satir, I'm big on, I believe that uh, a brain injury recovery needs to involve the whole person, body, soul, spirit, mind, and emotion. Because if you just focus on the brain injury, you're leaving out the body, so and you're leaving out the emotions, and the, you know. So I I believe that it's being able to tap into our creative abilities and our creative self, and you know, find out ways that will work for us. And you know, my my experience with people, and I have family members. My dad was like this. Um, you know, for people to be able to come out of their denial, they have to face things that they don't uh, may not know how to feel. Or how they may not know, how, you know, want want to feel, how to feel, want to feel. They may need need to make changes that they don't want to make, or don't need to make, or can't make. And as a result, it's just easier to, you know, in transactional analysis, they talk about passing the hot potato. You know, when people do not want to, do not know how to deal with their feelings and their emotions. They make somebody else responsible for that. So, so what I do on my website on Second Chance to Live, I talk a lot about. I've written twelve eBooks, and in these eBooks, I talk about family system issues, and I talk about a lot of different things. And I'm getting ready to put them up for sale, starting um, here in a little while. I don't know exactly when, but that's going to happen. So, what I really believe. You know, what I need to do for myself, because there was so much denial around me, is that I had to get to a point of realizing that all my efforts just were not working. You know, I tried diligently. I tried hard. I tried, tried like I've heard, you know, every every which right way to deal with the situation. And I couldn't because there were people around me telling me if I just keep my mouth shut or if I just do this or I just do that, then I wouldn't be affected. You know, so I turn a lot of that, you know, the anger inwards and blame myself for this, uh, this thing that I had no idea what was going on. So what I needed to do, I worked, um, when I was going, going to graduate school, actually before I went to graduate school, I worked in the cemetery and funeral business. When I was in the graduate school, I gave a presentation on the grieving process. You know, Kubler Ross's book on death and dying, she talks about, you know, denial. Facing denial. And I had to confront my own denial before yes. I could do anything else. You know, I had to then be angry about what I couldn't change. Then I became depressed. I, be, I tried to bargain my way out of being, you know, uh, being a brain injured for survivor. I tried to find my way out of that proverbial brown paper bag. And then I became depressed you know, about what I couldn't change. And then when I got to a point of being sick and tired about sick and tired, 
I began to realize that I had choices, that I could get into action, that I could do something different, that I could find a way that would work for me. That and and so so what I do is I I one of my presentations is on uh, creating our new normal. I think it's really really important for us that we don't wait for other people to get it because if we're waiting for people to get it, you know I've written this. Um, uh, this article I sent articles to Jason in Facebook, and one of the articles is why do I feel so misunderstood and shunned? You know, and the issue is, is that I I'm powerless over my brother is basically in this. You know, he's um he uh, he doesn't want, he has a hard time accepting the realities that I have to deal with. So um, he blames me for and he projects his anger onto me, and uh, I you know so. So the issue is I can't do anything about that. All I can do is work on me, you know, to create my own uh, new normal. And, um, you know, I just really encourage the audience, um, whoever's listening to this, to realize that you do not have to stay stuck. You do not have to wait for people to catch up to, to your un to understanding you. Because, you know, it, what it, what it becomes like in society is that whack-a-mole thing, you know? At the state fair, you know, you you try to whack one mole down and another mole pops up because people don't, there are all kinds of people around us that are not going to get it. I, I talk about a codependent dance. You know, for many years when I, I felt like I needed to do something different, you know, if you weren't okay, it was my fault. Therefore, I needed to make you okay so that we could be okay so I could hope to be okay because I felt a lot of abandonment. You know, that, and because I felt shame. Shame is different than guilt. Guilt is you made a mistake, you can do something about it. Shame is you made a mistake, it's a being wound. A wonderful book that really has helped me along the way, as well as other books, is um, uh, Shame and Guilt Masters of Disguise by Jane Middleton Mose. Again, that's uh, Shame and Guilt Masters of Disguise by Jane Middleton Mose. And in that, she talks about uh, the uh, you know, debilitating guilt and debilitating shame. She uses a fairy tale, which she explains in that um, book, to uh, illustrate. And, uh, you know, she's talking from her own journey and process. It's just not a cognitive thing. I think that as a result of being, um, you know, I, I, one of my pursuits academically was in seminary. And I was in one class, and my one of the professors' name was Dr. David Siemens, and he wrote a book called Healing for Damaged Emotions. And in that book, he talked about being a wounded healer. And I think that what happens with us is that we become wounded healers as we grow in our own awareness, you know, because it switches from sympathy, which is, oh, you poor thing, to empathy, I understand and that's what the wonderful thing, there's tremendous power in identification because identification helps us to come out of the shadows of isolation and break free from feelings of alienation from ourselves and from other people. But again, I, I just, really, you know, and, you know, our passions, they don't die. Here's a quote that I wrote that I want to share with you. It says, purpose is, a, is, a, is about a process and a journey. Not a destination. I cannot know until I know, and knowing just takes what it takes. There are no silver bullets or magic potions. By accepting that reality, I'm given the gift of knowing. I'm given the gift of knowing by trusting the process, a loving God, and myself. So, you know, it's just going to take time. It took me seven years, you know, to find what I, you know, to find, start Second Chance to Live. And before that, you know, when I first started, I was very cognitive in my writing. You know, I had a best friend in Florida. He used to call me Data, like the guy on uh, Star Trek The Next Generation because I was so logical. So what I had to do is I had to learn how to uh, join the emotive with the cerebral. And that, too, was a process because I'm, a, I'm an expansive thinker. And it's just hard for me not – I was so redundant for so many – you know, in my writings, it took me seven to eight hours to try to comb and change the articles so that it would be palatable for people to be able to read. So, you know, it's just been, and that too was a journey. So what I do is I just encourage people, start, you know, and um, 
you know, just start. And it's just really, really important to, like I said, I train in different martial arts and, uh, I think it's really important to do center line strikes and I've trained in a lot of different disciplines and, uh, so forth. So getting the brain and body in sync, uh, through the corpus callosum by doing center line strikes. It just helps to, to retrain the brain so we are able to do things that we couldn't do maybe before, which I had been able to do things that I never dreamed possible at 67. You know, now I've just uh, done, and I've shared that with my, um, I sent, uh, Bob, my, um, my uh, uh, biographical information and in there. There's two video presentations. One that was made in 2021 and the other one that was made March 16th of this year. So what I do is I continue to train, uh, you know, four, uh, three, two to three, maybe four times a week with uh, uh, neuroplasticity using um, a modern harness. I use Kali. I use a Filipino stick fighting. I use Western boxing. My primary art is Muay Thai, where I use elbows, knees. So I'm using all my uh, all, all, all parts of my body. So it's just a lots of like the Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. <laughs>